Roxo Media House. From the Flying T Club Studios at Roxo Media House, this is Frogs Today with special guests, former frog great, Amrick Fields, men's basketball associate head coach, Tony Benford, plus Greg Powers from Dave Campbell's Texas Football, and we'll check in on the Senior Bowl in Mobile. And now here's your host, the voice of the TCU Horn Frogs, Brian Estridge. Welcome into the Friday edition of Frogs Today. It feels like every show I start with, we got a lot we got to get into, but today we really do, folks. Uh, we got a lot of basketball we got to talk about. Tony Benford is going to join us, as you heard, a little bit later on. We're going to talk Senior Bowl, man. We got some football we got to get into, women's basketball as well. But we thought we'd start the show with one of the legends from uh, TCU basketball, one of the good guys, too. Amrick Fields joins us right now. Amrick, how you doing, man? Good to see good. you. Good. How are you, brother? Been a long time. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show, too. Yeah, really glad you're it. back. In, in, in Fort Worth. For those who don't remember, Amrick was from Oklahoma City, uh, scored over a thousand points in his career. Amrick was, go I'm going to go ahead and say this. Can I go ahead and say this? Okay. Amrick was going to be the all time leading scorer in TCU basketball history until you got hurt. S some have said that. Yes. Yeah. You, some have you, said that. Yeah, um, because that injury, was that sophomore year? Junior? That was. That, that was, was my year. sophomore year. Yeah. Yes. It was. Um, Actually, the beginning of my junior year. Yes. So I finished my sophomore year. I right. had a really good sophomore year. Um, I was fortunate enough to w fortunate enough to win uh, sixth man of the year that year. Yeah, I remember that out of the Mountain um, West. Yeah, and the Mountain West was packed that year. Yes, it, it was. was. Great. You know, Kawhi was in there. <laughs> yeah, Kawhi Leonard. Yeah. Jimmer for dead dropping sixty every other <laughs> At night. BYU. Yeah. Yes. So they were. The Mountain West was on fire that yep, year. Yep. So because you had um, San Diego State, BYU, UNLV, New Mexico, everybody was good, man. Yeah, it was. A, I think it was a yeah. four or five team league that year to make the yeah. tournament. Yeah, I, I would say we were probably in the prime of that conference. Yes. Um, back in those days, but yeah, I had a really good sophomore year. It was the beginning of my junior year. I think it was the third game. It of was the year. third game. Yeah, I remember. And we were playing our rivalry actually at SMU. Yep. We were playing for the Iron Skillet, and uh, which was a big deal for me. Yeah. Um, and I remember that we ran a play for me. I was actually starting at the three, believe it or right, not, back right. then. Oh, yeah. Um, could move a little bit better. And you but could step back and shoot Yeah, it. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could move a little bit better back then. But um, we ran a play for me. It was within the first 13 seconds of the game. I came off a shuffle cut off the three and then just... I blew out everything in my right knee. Yeah, it was it was a freakish thing. I remember that, and it, and it was one of those at the time you you thought, oh man, I hope this isn't as bad as it looked. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, yeah. it was. And you missed the rest of the year, mm -hmm. and then missed the first couple of games of the next season, from what I yeah. recall. Yeah. Uh, but you were able to come back. You changed your game, though. And I love that about you. You adapted. Yeah. You became more of a back to the basket player. Yeah. I uh, I got a little heavier up top for sure. Yeah. Um, put a little size on. I wasn't able to move as well after the injury. Um, I actually I, I had I ended up having eight surgeries on this right knee. Wow. But I had I tore my ACL, MCL. Um, you know my patella tendon was all gone. Right. On. Uh, I actually had microfracture surgery, which at the time, um, Amari Stoudemire was kind of going through that. It was that new age of, I don't know how athletes are going to be after that. Yes. Um, so, and then Kendrick Williams actually had it after me, which right. is a great NBA player. And responded great. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I had that going on, and then I was able to bounce back a little bit, and I came back three games after the year, and I think I... I don't know if I led us in scoring. You but did. I was, yeah, I yeah. had I had around 13, 14 yep. games. Yep. Um, it was your best year. Yeah. If you look yeah, back it on was. it, as far as your average was concerned, I think you averaged 14 a game, man. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was. A, I had a great team around me, and yeah. Kean Anderson was there, also yes. a TCU legend. Yep. He was a great guy, and then um, also Thomas Monagel, who's yep. on the staff yep. at TCU right now, is the best guy. It is the best guy. <laughs> yeah. You know that you could have around you in those times. So. Um, I was able to bounce back a little bit, yeah. Um, but it still wasn't, um, and I think everybody else felt that too. Me at a hundred percent, right, right, yeah. But the one thing you did do is you persevered, uh, and then after TCU basketball was over with, you ended up playing overseas for several yeah. years, and that was a neat experience. You said, huh? My journey overseas was actually it, it was kind of a weird thing to me too. So I was done with basketball after my senior year because I had. After that initial surgery, I ended up having um, six more surgeries yeah. um, where they had to remove bone fragments and other things like that within my knee because the 
the initial uh, injury was so bad. So um, after my senior year, I kind of said I was done with basketball. So I contacted Coach Christian, who I still have a good relationship yeah. with. He's a great guy. His birthday's coming up next week, I think. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's a really good guy and that staff with Chip and all them. Yeah. And uh, we hit it off, and he wanted me to bring it out there. So I ended up going to Boston College for a little bit. I was at Boston College and kind of working out with the guys and stuff like that, getting in semi shape, but I wasn't in great shape. And then that summer, I ended up getting in a little bit better shape, working on my legs and my knees and stuff like that. And um, I was with a big guy there, Clifford, and uh, he asked me one time after we got in the workout, and he said, Coach, do you ever think about playing still? Yeah. You know, it seems like you got a little, a little left in the tank if you ever thought about it. And uh, at the time, I kind of blew it off, and then I kind of pondered it when I was at home, and I ended up contacting an agent. The agent ended up signing me, and uh, I was overseas within the next three months. Right. Yeah. In some good spots. Germany, you were in France, right? At one yeah, point? I was in Cologne, Germany, which I loved. Yes. It was a great city. Yeah. Um, and then I was in France and Epinel for a little bit. And then I played Slovenia, where it's Luca's from. Yeah, right. And yeah. Right. It's only a country about two or about three or four million people, I would say. Yeah. But the basketball is phenomenal Huge. there. Yeah, yeah. They love yeah, it too, don't they? Yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. So the great experience in another way. Yeah, I had a bunch of great experiences, great culture experiences. Um, TCU also prepared me for that. Yeah. Um, being from a small town in Oklahoma. I like to say I'm from Oklahoma City, but I'm from Bethany, Oklahoma. Right, right, right. Um, which is a Putnam little bit. City West? Yeah, how Putnam about City that? West. How can, how can I remember that, man? I know. Putnam <sighs> City yeah. West, yes. you got a great memory. <laughs> but um, yeah, Putnam City West. And um, I came out of a small town, which was I fell in love with TCU because of the private atmosphere there, right. too. I love so um, being a small town guy it was perfect yeah well it's been a, it's been a good run for you you've got to be enjoying what you're seeing out of this year's team 17 wins already for yeah. uh, Jamie Dixon's team oh, yeah. what, do you, what do you like so far um I, I love them I've been watching them for a while I yeah. dabbled in some riding for a little bit for the killer frogs I knew that yeah. um, so I watched them a little bit last year but the growth from last year to this year has been um, tremendous I mean, I can't believe when we have all the pieces together, it actually feels like we have a Final Four team. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? You know, we're, yeah. we're dangerous from so many angles, and the way that Jamie constructs it is it's beautiful. I admire the way he coaches. I really do. In transition, they're fun to watch, too. Man. Oh, the I, best in the nation, yeah, I would say, right yeah, now. I agree. Yeah. Tell folks what you're up to right now, Aaron, because uh, uh, you're still back, you're back in the basketball world. Yeah, I am. I, I'm coaching for Trinity Valley right now. Um, I'm doing that kind of part-time. I did have another full-time gig on the side, but I decided to coach on basketball right now, so I'm yeah. kind of getting my feet wet in that area, yeah. kind of see where that transitions to. Well, I can see you being really good with those guys, too. Good mentor for them, the kind of guy you want uh, you want your kids to be around. I try like to be. Yeah. yeah, I try to be. They're great kids. Yeah. They're great kids. And there's a great program out there, David Rodriguez and that group. They're right. great. Well, you've always done a terrific job, man, uh, of caring yourself and representing TC. I appreciate that. Good ambassador. Glad, yeah. I'm glad you stopped by to see Thank us. Thank you. Man. Thank you much for being here. I appreciate it. Amrick Fields joining us, talking a little TCU basketball right now. Coming up next, we're going to stay in hoops mode as Tony Benford, the associate head coach of the Horn Frogs, joins us. Uh, we'll preview the matchup with Oklahoma State on Saturday. We'll do that when Frogs Today on the Friday continues after this time, man. Dave's Hot Chicken is a cult favorite and now has two locations in Fort Worth, Bryant Irvin Road on I-20 and Berry Street at TCU, both owned and operated by Horned Frogs. Mention the Frogs Today show and get 10% off anytime and order online at daveshotchicken.com. The Flying Tea Club provides the everyday TCU fan and alum the ability to specifically support TCU student athletes. Flying Tea Club offers three levels of memberships. The Flying Tea Club is a nonprofit organization supporting the brand development of TCU student athletes through a series of unique event based networking opportunities, which are exclusive to our members. These events provide a great social engagement tool for our members and student athletes alike. Follow them on Instagram at Flying Tea Club or online at flyingteaclub.com. Texas-based Happy Water offers the best-tasting, sugar-free kids drink ever made. Happy Water comes in four delicious flavors that you can find at local retailers and on Amazon. Each pouch contains zero grams of sugar, zero calories, and zero percent juice. Head to happydrinks.com for more information and to purchase Happy Water. That's H-A-P-I drinks.com. Live happy. Be happy. Drink happy. 
Friday edition of Frogs Today continues right now with one of our favorites. Tony Benford's the associate head coach of the Horn Frogs uh, for men's basketball. We always enjoy it when Tony's on with us. So I want to dive right into the West Virginia game first before we talk about Oklahoma State. Coach, of course, the Horn Frogs playing at 1 o'clock on Saturday. I felt like going into that game, you really challenged your bigs. You spent a lot of time with those guys to be more physical against West Virginia, and they responded. No, no doubt. No doubt. I thought our guys came out uh, again. Brian played extremely well. Our big guys were we worked on it in practice. We showed them film uh, how, you know, when we played that old Miss, how we did not do a great job with our post defense. We did not do a great job blocking out their big guy. And he's one of the best big guys we played all year. Uh, the kid Toto Smith and uh, he's a very quality big. But I thought uh, they took on the challenge, especially Xavier uh, Court. Uh, he was very physical uh, on both ends of the floor. I mean, I thought he 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 boxed out. He played great post defense and rebounded the ball, and and, and then he was very good aggressively offensively. And I thought uh, Eddie came in and gave us some. What is obviously with him been limited, gave us some very positive minutes on both ends of the floor. Also, and then Suli, so we we challenged Suli to you know be a great screener, rebounder, and run the floor, and he gave us great minutes. His you know three or four minutes that he played. So uh, we challenged him, and I thought they responded uh, very well. You and I know it as a Willis Reed moment for Eddie Lampkin. Our PR director, Steve Schoen, refers to it as a Byron Leftwich moment. Whatever generation you're a part yeah, exactly. of, it's good to see Eddie Lampkin out there. There's no doubt. I mean, Eddie's our inspirational leader. He plays hard. He wanted to play more minutes, but we, you know, we want to have to make, you know, make sure we protect him from, from himself because we need him to be healthy uh, the remainder of the season, you know, the, the going into this weekend and next week and, and the remainder of the season. But uh, he wanted to play more. But, you know, we know that he's he's very valuable to us, and, and uh, I think he'll be ready to go hopefully uh, this weekend. You know a guy that I, I really started to appreciate his game, and I, I went back and looked at his numbers again against West Virginia, and, and that's Jacoby Coles. I mean, he comes in, provides you instant offense, and I think he's improved as a defender and rebounder as well. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, Jacoby is a very good player. I mean, he's a guy that can score at all three levels. I mean, what I mean by that, he can shoot the three, mid-range. He can obviously was post up, face up game, and and he can rebound the ball. And he's a very, you know, like I say, he's a smart player. Uh, he's gotten better defense. That's the area that we challenge him, coaches challenge him, our staff is challenge him to improve on. He's done a better, a great job on that end. And he's an instant bucket when he comes in. We said Jacoby per minute played. He's gonna get up some shots, but uh, but he's very efficient too. And so uh, we're very fortunate to have him. He's just a sophomore and. Uh, He's got a bright future for us, and uh, we, he's a guy that we know we can count on, especially late in games. We know he's going to make free throws, and one of the best free throw shooters, probably our best free throw shooter on our team, and one of the best free throw shooters in, in the league. So uh, we look for Jacoby to, to play a lot of quality minutes for us moving forward. Speaking of basketball IQ, I love the fact that Coach Dixon, you, you have Damian Ball put together a, a double-double, and the first thing he points out was a couple of decisions that he didn't like that were turnovers. But the thing about Damian Ball, because Coach is always looking for perfection, by the way, think about Damian Ball. There's a guy with a high basketball IQ. There are some subtle things that take place on the floor that Damian does that a lot of players don't do. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, Damian, uh, he's that's the game. He sees a game. Uh, it comes, uh, I don't say come easy to him, but he's got a great vision, like a quarterback. Yeah. Uh, he, he he knows, he sees it before it's about to happen. And, and one thing that he does a great job of is putting our guys in there, especially in our transition. He's one of the reasons we lead in the country in, in, in fast break points. He gets out on a break and he doesn't hang on to the ball. You yeah. see guys running, he gets rid of it. And and, he, and it leads, when you talk about good point guards, I mean, that his passes lead to guys uh, getting baskets. So he puts them in a position where all they got to do is, is finish the play. And I think that's one of the things that he's done for us. And, and obviously there's a lot of pressure on him right now with, with Mike being out. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, he may make a couple of plays there. You go, oh, well, why did he do that? But uh, but we know he's going to make more good plays and solid plays than he are, you know, than those mistakes sometimes that he may occasionally make. But he's a great leader. He sets the tone for us defensively out front. That's where your defense starts. And he's doing a great job. And I thought he had a great game the other day with that double-double. Let's switch gears real quick to Oklahoma State. Coming up Saturday tomorrow at 1 o'clock from uh, Gallagher Iba Arena. Always a difficult place to play. And this is a team, well, I tell you what, they're, they're pretty good at home. They're sitting at 9-2 and two at home. Overall in the league, they're 4-5. and five. But Mike Boynton seemed always a tough out, it feels like. It's no doubt. I'll tell you what, uh, uh, Mike's doing a great job. I mean, I love his team. I mean, they play hard. They're the best defensive team in our league right now. You know, when you start looking at the numbers and uh, they're number seven in the country defensively and they really get hang their hats on their defense and rebounding and, and they're very good in trans and they're very good in transition and they turn people over. 
I mean, they're one of the top teams in the league and in the country as far as forcing turnovers. And so they got a lot of good athletes. They, they're, they're big guys. Uh, Boone is playing as well as anybody in our league right now, yeah. any post player in our league. And so, uh, you know, then uh, you know Bryce Thompson's made he's he's uh, solid. They're a veteran ball club. Avery Anderson, and then they brought in a transfer uh, from High Point that's doing really good for them at the, at the kind of a combo guard. And so uh, they have some really good pieces. And so it's always a tough place to play. And and uh, you know, I know they'll be ready to go because I think they're in state tournament team. I mean, they yeah. are very, very good. They did a great job the other night against uh, Oklahoma and shut those guys down. And so uh, we're gonna have our hands full going into uh, Galar Iva. Uh, you, you know, uh, the, the interesting thing is you, you've been trying to juggle lineups all year long. Uh, what are we at? Twelve or thirteen different lineups, yeah. something like that. Uh, meanwhile, they got four players who've played all twenty-two games and started all twenty-two games. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. I mean they got uh, a lot of those guys are returning players, and they they've been together all year. They took some. You know, had a few lumps there. Uh, you know, took a, few, a couple lost there early on, but uh, yeah. they're playing really well. They won four out of five, uh, four of their five games, and, and they're especially tough, like you mentioned, Brian, at home. And so uh, we got to do a great job, make sure we take care of the basketball. You know, we've got to limit our turnovers against these guys, and uh, we've got to make sure we rebound the basketball and really execute offensively. You know, you look at the number of possessions uh, that this team has. Talking about Oklahoma State, they average what about sixty-eight points a game. Is this is one? Is this one where they're and and they hold teams to about sixty-one? I think it is. Are, yeah, are, yeah. are they are they going to slow the tempo down of the frogs? Because I think we're all in agreement that when the frogs are in transition, they're as good as anybody in the country. Well, they they might, but Brian, they do a great job of trying to turn you over. I mean, eventually yeah. they'll mix up their defense. They're man to man. They'll 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 uh, two two one back to two three zone and. They really get it out of ball, great ball pressure, overplay the pass lane. And then they lead the league in shot blocking. They have, you know, with Boone and, C, I mean, and say, I mean, they, they're really good at protect. They got two really good rim protectors. So uh, they like to run now. They will get out and push the basketball, especially off turnovers, live ball turnovers. And, uh, if you, you know, they're out in transition. So uh, it's going to be a game where we got to really take care of the ball and we got to be sound defensively too. Yeah, Caleb Boone already 30 blocks on the year. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, I really, mean, that's, that's a big number here. Huge number, a huge number. Yeah, yeah, a huge number. Tony Benford, always appreciate the time. Frogs in Oklahoma State coming up at 1 o'clock. Really appreciate you joining us, Coach. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Take care. That's Tony Benford joining us. we got more on Frogs today, including a look at the Senior Bowl that's happening right now. Five Horn Frogs in Mobile. We'll dive into it next when Frogs Today continues on the Friday after this time. Say hello to the water of tomorrow. Richard's Rainwater. Richard's Rainwater is 100% rain. Refreshing, renewable, and the only ingredient we use in our water. Why rain? Because everyone deserves access to clean water. And rain is a 100% renewable resource available everywhere. Drink the rain. Save the planet. Shop now at richardsrainwater.com. Exclusive interviews and content on TC Recruits. Subscribe now at frogstoday.com. Any sport, anytime. It's your source for all things TCU. Only on frogstoday.com. Frogs Today on the Friday continues right now. Good stuff there from Tony Benford, the associate head coach of the Horn Frogs. We get ready for that matchup tomorrow against Oklahoma State. Shifting gears now. Let's talk a little TCU football. Uh, coming up this weekend is the Senior Bowl down in Mobile, of course. Horn Frogs are what represented with uh, five TCU players down there. One of our good friends is calling that game on radio for the Senior Bowl. His name is J.D. Byers. He's the terrific voice of South Alabama, and he's kind enough to give us some time right now. J.D., good to see your face, man. I want to I want to dive right into this. This is a this is a week long experience in Mobile. That's a or in, in, in uh, Mobile. It's kind of a big deal for everybody, isn't it? Yeah, and for the, the sake of Mobile and those who are visiting. They also get to experience Mardi Gras because this is where Mardi Gras started. It was right. in Mobile, Alabama. It wasn't actually New Orleans. So the, the, the folks who come in get a taste of that. Uh, but then for the folks who live here, if you go one state over, Brian, and you look into the state of Georgia, the biggest draw uh, tourist-wise, visitor-wise, is normally the Atlanta Braves. Uh, in the state of Alabama, the biggest tourist draw are the beaches. But as it plays to a single event every year, the most eyes across the country are the Senior Bowl, the Reese's Senior Bowl played right here in Mobile, Alabama. So the entire state really embraces this thing. The city does as well. It's got some really great corporate partners, and it's well attended as well, and plus national TV all week. Yeah, and all week long because they've been uh, covering practice and workouts and everything leading up to this. Give me some sense of what all these players are put through leading up to the game this weekend. So – 
the week as far as at the their digs, so to speak, and their accommodations, it's going to be very NFL esque or you know, but somewhat what they've been used to in the Power Five football. For those who've played in this game out of Division Two or, or a FCS, they're really getting the red carpet. They've never experienced anything quite like this. Uh, I, I do get the privilege of about two weeks before is getting on a conference call with the executive director of this game, and Jim Nagy and I are very close, and he gives me a very good look at what attracted uh, the guys to the game because it's normally the scouts and the NFL front offices. They're asking and saying, we want to see this guy. And it's not always a first and second rounder. It's guys they think they may be looking at in third, fifth, sixth, and subsequent rounds. And it's many times they're intangibles. That has what has to show this week. There's one-on-one matchups. There's drills. Did he beat him? Did he not? Does he have technique? Does he have potential? But they also want to know, who is this guy? And so off the field, a very key is sitting across a table and looking at a general manager or a coach in the eye and ask, uh, answering questions. And that could play very high into what round you go in or if you go at all. Yeah. And, and so are these NFL teams or all NFL teams there for the entire week? Pr- pretty much. And often it is, it's the brass and the coach or coaches. So you'll have GMs here. And so our area, geograph- geographically, we're accustomed to seeing these guys out. You can go out on the causeway, go to one of the restaurants or downtown, and you may be sitting one table over uh, from Bill Belichick. Uh, he may not talk to you, but you, you see him out, except on game day, which is very unique that a lot of people don't know, is they're here during the week, and then on game day, more 99% of the time, they're going to watch either at home on a TV or not watch it at all. They get everything they want during practice in the drills, whether it's at our indoor facility or out at the stadium or interviewing them there at the hotel. Are you eating at the Oyster House uh, when you see Bill Belichick? Is that where it's at? <laughs> I don't know what his favorite one is down yeah. here. <laughs> but but really, out on the causeway, we've got some great uh, seafood oh, yeah. restaurants, and uh, you'll see a lot of them out there. And a lot of them actually have pictures on the wall they've collected over the years that are autographed by some former head coaches, and there's truly some legends uh, of people who've come through, broadcasters as well, who've oh, done sure. the Senior Bowl. So it, it, that's kind of cool memorabilia to see in these restaurants, all because of this one game every year in Mobile. Where do they put the teams up at? Where, Because I know there's a national team and an American team. Do they stay together? And wh- where where do they house them at? So if you've ever seen our skyline, it's not yep. Dallas. But, you know, we have some pretty big buildings down there. Got the so Adams really? Mark. Used to be the Adams yeah. Mark. What is it now? Yeah. Um, it, actually, we own it. RSA, the Retirement Systems of Alabama. Oh, okay. So we love to see them use that. That's more yeah. for our retirement account. But uh, – you got the Renaissance Riverview, which is the really big hotel, and then less than a block over, you got the Battle House. They're both owned by the same people, but it's the Riverview Plaza is where the really nice digs are. Then they'll go over and have some of their other events right across Water Street, overlooking Mobile Bay at the Convention Center. It's gotcha. really nice. Uh, yes. That's where they do some of their radio rows. So the 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 prospects who've normally not got a lot of media attention. We'll get some there because there's a lot of guys coming from all over America doing their weekly talk shows for sports radio or whatever, uh, and they interview them. So they get a lot of reps doing media, which is good for them. Plus, that might warm them up when they're having to talk to a GM or their future employer in the league. All right, let me uh, me leave you with this, um, uh, J.D. Have you heard anything out of the five from TCU? Any talk about uh, Max Duggan or any of those guys? I know on the defensive side of the ball, you know, I think you've got two on that side, three yeah. offensively uh, is they, they really like Dylan Horton. Uh, the, the big, uh, of course, he's from Texas, is th- the comments from uh, Jim Nagy is his relentlessness, relentlessness as an edge rusher. They just yeah. think he fits that mold both in size and aggressiveness. And, of course, Steve Winters, uh, the linebacker, they think he could go – a little bit higher because they think he's going to have a really good interview when he's down here. They think he's one of those guys that will impress. Yeah, no question about that. J.D. Byers, have uh, fun calling that game, man. What a treat. Uh, uh, You'll uh, future NFL stars there on the field at South Alabama. Uh, Congratulations on that. Thanks for hopping on with us here today, my man. I'm hoping they invite me to the combine and show my kicking skills. (laughs) I love that. That's right. Former kicker at North Alabama, right? Did I get (laughs) that right? I love purple. Yeah, I love it. I love it. J.D. Byers joining us here, the voice of South Alabama. We asked David Bowden to stick around uh, to talk about those five guys that are there. Uh, Obviously, Max Duggan, the headliner uh, for TCU at quarterback. Let's start with him. 
What are folks here? What are you hearing from folks about uh, his performance so far during the week? And then what's Max trying to prove to folks at this point? Yeah, I, I think he's been really impressive from everything you see and hear automobile. I think the, the thing right now is some of the his weaknesses that are listed going in as you know they give that gra uh, draft grade out. Some of those weaknesses really are, are on the past, right? They're looking at some, some of those earlier years in college where he struggled, kind of zoned in on receivers. We had some interceptions that, because of just kind of staring guys down, maybe not fully understanding. And again, this is the, what the you know, list is from, from the scouts, fully not understanding defensive concepts and coverages. I think he put, you know, in my opinion, put a lot of that stuff to bed this season, and he's only continuing to disprove you know, those weaknesses this week here, and yeah. he's done a great job of that. I mean, a few times that I've seen some uh, video, and we've, we've gotten a couple of, in fact, uh, J.D. was kind enough to get us some video of guys. I mean, I, I'm seeing him throwing, he, he, he's throwing rockets around out there. Yeah, he's, he's dicing them up, yeah. and, you know, and he's doing it in, in one-on-ones, which I think everyone knew he could, but also in, in seven-on-seven, -seven, in team activities, which I think really is opening a lot of eyes. Uh, from from his performance so far, you mentioned you heard uh, JD mention Dylan Horton by the way, the defensive end. He and D Winters on the defensive side, uh, both with huge upsides, and this that's where a week like this can really help him, right? There's no question. Yeah, you look at, at Dylan Horton as a guy. Of course, he started off as a safety in yeah. high school. He's put on 75 pounds wow. since high school. He's you know down the street and, and from Frisco, went to New Mexico, bumped down to linebacker. Uh, transferred to TCU as a junior and now has his hand in the dirt. Yeah. Uh, and so, again, we looked at him. He's just not polished, which is to be expected for a guy who's just learning the position. He certainly has the speed. He's kept that speed you know, as if he was a, a back-end de defender. So it helps him in pass rush. He still plays a little bit high, and, and I think he's getting some really good coaching again this week. They did a nice job with him at TCU um, you know, as an edge rusher. And then against the run, he's got to understand to squeeze things and not just run up field. But it's again, it's instinctual. And those, the good things for him is he has all the skills. No, those are learnable skills, which he's going to continue to hone in on. The great thing about Dylan, too, is you saw him get more and more comfortable with that position as the season went on. And then what happened is sack total started shooting up. Yeah. Uh, you know, he had four sacks in three games there to to end the year. All right, let's that's uh, that's that side of it. Let's talk about the offense now. Uh, well, first of all, I want to ask you about D. Winter. So yeah. uh, D D's a little. Would we say a little undersized at yeah. linebacker yeah. for the NFL? It, he is, it's especially because you know his skill set. Really, he's a great pass rusher, right? Right. He's undersized, but has elite quickness and get off uh, off the ball. That's been you know he, he he's not a defender right now that can block him all week, right? right? You see offensive linemen. He is just in one on ones and again in team settings, uh, really making some noise. A little undersized, but a, a guy who uses his speed really well and understands how to leverage his body. Um, especially in pass rush. And then it kind of puts some doubters to bed in terms of coverage. He had an interception. I, I think two of them, you know, again, in team settings during practice. And, again, these are going against really good quarterbacks, of course, because they're invited as well. So I think his stock is rising because of his experience this week. All right, Steve Avila. Uh, he's been going up against some of the best offensive linemen all year that we've seen here, not only in the Big 12, I think about Texas Tech, but then Michigan and, and Georgia. Give me some sense of what the question marks on him coming in. Yeah, I, personally, I you know, not that, not what I think matters, but I, I think he's I think he's elite yeah. offensive lineman, interior offensive lineman. Um, I think people almost forgot that he played center. You know, he was right. originally a center. He, he settled in at guard this past year. Um, you know, because they had a transfer come over from from SMU, to, as did TCU. But uh, so he's he's snapped quite a bit this week. He's done a really nice job against big SEC defensive linemen, stoning guys at the line of scrimmage uh, in one-on-one -on -one pass rush. And I think he's really, he's a guy that, that's going to go, you know, first, he's projected, you know, third to fourth round. I honestly think he's going to creep up and, and go earlier. You know, I, I'm going to ask you this question. It's going to show uh, that I'm a lay person in this regard. And, and you kind of give me a hard time because I focus on this sometimes. But I, but I wonder, as an offensive lineman, is there an advantage to being left-handed. Is there an advantage at all? Yeah, I, I you know, I don't or know. Does it doesn't matter. No, I don't know if it matters okay. so much. I mean, it, you know, you're going to have to play. The way the offensive lines now and the, the injuries and the attrition right. in the NFL, you've got to be able to line up on both sides. You've got right. to get in a left-handed and right-handed stance. Um, you know, and I, so I, I know as a, a snapper, a guy who snaps the ball, yeah. you know, if you're if you're Spins left-handed. Spins different. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's, there's I didn't know there. as far as that punch is concerned. Right. You know, that first punch of the offensive line. If that yeah. comes from, from the left side instead of the right, right. is that different for 
defensive line. Yeah, I think I, I, to me it's it's more pronounced that tackle right yeah. out, on, out on the edge uh, where you're past that and you get into a spot and you have sort of that combat hand yep. and that punch hand right. uh, and so that that matters a little bit more I think. But on the interior, I think it's uh, it kind of levels out a little okay, bit. Okay, Darius Davis, uh, the uh, the fifth of uh, the five that are there. Uh, again, he, he's a slot guy in the NFL. You'd have to assume going to rely on his speed and maybe as a returner too. I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously he had you know all kinds of uh, TCU records in terms yeah. of returns, and he, he's a guy that's extremely dangerous and always looking for those guys in the NFL that can do multiple things, line up all over the field. Um, you know, as a slot guy, but motion in and out uh, as offenses have evolved, those guys are moving all over the place. Right. And then you know, in the return game, I think he could be dangerous at the next level. And then you know, of course, line up at wide receiver too, this Quentin Johnson, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, let's not forget about, about him. Who, right. Many say, and this hasn't changed because of this week, that he's the top receiver on, on the board. Yeah. Um, you know, and as people look at him, I, I think they want to see, to be the number one receiver, I just think they want to see consistency out of him. And I think he's proven that, you know, in this week, just even in a short time, he's yeah. done a nice job day in and day out of being that guy. Yeah, all right, good stuff there. Uh, we, it's been a busy football week, as a matter of fact. Uh, you had Senior Bowl going on. Uh, you had the recruiting day, which not as big as it used to be, but, but was still a big deal. As a matter of fact, I got Greg Powers coming on from uh, Dave Campbell's Texas football. You, you want to stick around and talk yeah, with him? Yeah, let's do that. All right, yeah, good, yeah, good. Let's do that. All right, uh, Greg Powers is going to join us next. We'll talk about uh, signing day for the Horn Frogs earlier in the week and where this entire class stacks up now. We'll do that as a Friday edition of Frogs Today continues after this time. Dave's Hot Chicken is a cult favorite and now has two locations in Fort Worth, Bryant Irvin Road on I-20 and Berry Street at TCU, both owned and operated by Horned Frogs. Mention the Frogs Today show and get 10% off anytime and order online at daveshotchicken.com. At Higginbotham, we put people first. So we simply start by listening to you. Whether you're searching for customized insurance, HR, or financial solutions to protect your home, car, health, business, or employees, our specialists are here to serve you, the people you care about, and your success. Higginbotham, insurance, HR, and financial services, inspired by you. For exclusive interviews and content on TCU Recruits, subscribe now at frogstoday.com. Any sport, anytime. It's your source for all things TCU. Only on frogstoday.com. Say hello to the water of tomorrow. Richard's Rainwater. Richard's Rainwater is 100% rain. Refreshing, renewable, and the only ingredient we use in our water. Why rain? Because everyone deserves access to clean water, and rain is a 100% renewable resource available everywhere. Drink the rain. Save the planet. Shop now at richardsrainwater.com. The Flying Tea Club provides the everyday TCU fan and alum the ability to specifically support TCU student athletes. Flying Tea Club offers three levels of memberships. The Flying Tea Club is a nonprofit organization supporting the brand development of TCU student athletes through a series of unique event based networking opportunities, which are exclusive to our members. These events provide a great social engagement tool for our members and student athletes alike. Follow them on Instagram at Flying Tea Club or online at flyingteaclub.com. Back with Cowboy Frogs today. We told you we we're going to stick with the football. David Bowden's alongside uh, as well. Of course, our dissecting the frogs uh, guru. But we thought we'd bring in a recruiting guru as well. Uh, not that you. Not that you're not a recruiting <laughs> guru, but I'm, not, I'm not like this guy. Not like this guy. Yeah. Greg Powers joins us from Dave Campbell's Texas Football. Kind enough to carve out some time for us here today for Frogs Today. And Greg, let's just dive right into this one. We, you, you kind of had the ho hum signing day this week, which is what it's become for some of these uh, elite programs around the country. The recruiting class, kind of all the haze in the barn, but there were a couple of uh, additions for TCU and for others. Give me some sense as to how you feel like the Horn Frogs have done so far coming off that uh, championship caliber season? Well, we put up our rankings yesterday for, you know, all the schools in Texas and TCU finished second behind Texas in my mind, factoring in not only what they did, you know, uh, recruiting the prep ranks throughout the high schools in America, but what they've done in the transfer portal, I think is really special as well. They've got some really big time guys coming in from both ranks. So I, I think TCU's done a, a great job. And, and one thing that, I really feel like 
people are going to say, oh, well, TCU's doing good because they played the national championship. I don't necessarily feel like that is the case 100%. I feel like Sonny Dykes and his staff there at TCU have, have found a great recipe for success as it relates to recruiting because of where they're at in the DFW Metroplex. They kind of honed in on that at SMU, uh, and they do a good job of doing this um, – recruiting now and for recruiting later when they're talking to these high school kids. So when they're looking to bounce somewhere back in the transfer portal, they've already built some relationships there. And I think that pays huge dividends. Yeah, no, I, I think Greg, you, you're spot on. I think it, it, they've increased that footprint a little bit. Wouldn't you say when you look at SMU and, and they would, everyone would come back home to Dallas. Now they're really that, that mantra out there is come back home to DFW, right? And they've expanded that. Yeah. And you've seen that here in the, in the transfer portal lately. Yeah, no doubt. And and you can look up and down that transfer portal list. These are these are football playing dudes, right? Like Tommy Brockermeyer was the number one player in the state, a five-star offensive lineman. Um, Jojo Earl, we all remember how special he was at Alito, uh, a guy who you want to find ways to put the football into his hands. And you have Trey Sanders, you know, come those are just three that they got from Alabama, right? Like they got three <laughs> guys from Alabama. But there are some other guys on this list that I, I really like. I think Jalen Robinson, um, because of his experience, because he's been to some different programs, um, I think he started at OU, then went to UCF, then Ole Miss, now he's at TCU. I think because of he's so well-traveled and, and he has an elite skill set as a guy that can is like a plug-and-play type of guy, right? And that's really what you're looking for in the transfer portal is, is guys – who can come in and move the needle on day one. And I think that he'll add a unique, uh, a unique presence to the offense. Somebody who can get the ball underneath, understands how to get open in the slot and create separation. I think he's a guy who can step in and, and make an immediate impact. Yeah. You mentioned plug and play, Greg. One of the things that Sonny Dykes has talked about is they still want to sign high school players. That's kind of where you build your base, your foundation, and you use that portal for specific positions, specific needs did they do that this year yeah i think so i mean i definitely do you know quentin johnston isn't going to be there next year right and they need guys that uh, are going to be able to stretch the field vertically i looked at the 2022 tcu offense and felt like it was a very unique blend you had the guy that could get up the field and make plays but really it was a kind of like a powerhouse offense from the a running game perspective you know and that's what I think made it so diverse or so difficult to defend is that you didn't know how you were going to get hit. You didn't know if it was going to be somebody, um, well, even then you throw Duggan's running ability into the mix, right? Like they just stretched you out so many different ways. And it's not going to be the same offense next year, but you need to find these guys that can come in and make it just as good, but in a different way. And I think that they've done a good job of doing that. And the high school ranks, like the guy who I love is Cordell Russell. It, it, it's hard to look at a prep guy and think, oh, he's going to come in and make a year one impact. You know, Jordan Hudson was great last year. He was a great prep player, but Cordell's one of these guys who I feel like has improved his game year over year in high school and could be ready for the rigors of college life and, and be able to step onto the field and play early. And of course, I think he was an early enrollee as well. So that might help him too. Yeah. And the other thing, Greg, with, with Cordell, which is nice, is that as they try and make their mark, continue to make their mark in DFW, Cordell really has been a Pied Piper for those guys in, in DFW really trying to rally and, and, you know, some of these late guys that were on the fence, he's been doing a great job recruiting himself, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. And it, they, good players want to be around other good players. Right. And TCU just did a good job in that recruitment in general. You will remember a time where Russell decommitted, yep. you know, and it's not one of the toughest things to do on the recruiting trails to get someone who decommitted to come back into the fold. And TCU won that battle twice. Wow, pretty amazing. Any influence uh, after the Kendall Bryles hire? Did you see that at all in recruiting? You know, not yet. I, I'm interested to see how it will affect the 2024 class. And yeah. I look at their loan commitment in that 2024 class as Marcos Davila, right? The quarterback yeah. who committed out for Midland Legacy. I noticed that he didn't have an Arkansas offer on his profile. And it wasn't necessarily someone... Um, that Kendall Bryles was recruiting, you know, um, does he fit into that offense or how does he fit into that offense? And is that a, is that a, a tale that they can effectively translate to Davila to keep him on the commitment list? Lucky, luckily for TCU and all the programs in Texas, the 2024 crop of quarterbacks in the state 
is deep. There are a lot of guys. There's going to be like 20 guys who are P5 level type of talents. You know, they're not all going to sign to P5, but they have grades of P5 level talent. So it's going to be a deep quarterback year. They're not going to have a problem finding a prep guy to, to join that 2024 class. If, if, that's a big if, right? Because I know Davila loves TCU. If something were to go awry there, I think that they could uh, get him back, get another quarterback into the fold. Yeah, I agree with you, Greg. I think the good news is if they are looking to hold on to Marcos, you know, a, a, a bright spot was just this past weekend, you know, during junior day on, on a Sunday, that he drove out from Midland, uh, you know, word was he spent the day and into the, the evening there uh, before driving back out west. And so, you know, that's a good sign of looking to hang on. My, you know, you mentioned Kendra Miller and just kind of the power running game from last year. And obviously they have a, they have a hole losing their top two running backs. Um, you know, obviously Kendra with, with the draft and, and um, Amari had been there. Uh, Amari DiMaccaro had been at TCU, it felt like uh, a decade. Yeah. But, uh, so they're gone, but you, know, you look from the prep uh, program, you've got this uh, uh, you know, guy down from uh, Round Rock, uh, Cameron Cook, who's committed. They, they beat out, it seemed like they beat out Texas for him. And then this 24 class, they're working on two local products. I know uh, Kay Durham out of Duncanville was in town and Kiwan Lacey uh, from Lancaster. Can you tell us a little bit about what you know, it's sort of the replacement plan or for that for that running back position for the Frogs? Well, I, I like uh, Trey Sanders is kind of being like that thunder, right? right? Like he's a big body back, a guy that has a lot of strength. Um, not, I'm not as familiar with him because, you know, he's not a Texas guy. He's not someone that I covered, but I've watched enough of him to, to understand that he's he's somebody who can run over you. Cameron Cook is quite different. You know, Cameron Cook is... I really struggled like with the rankings process to, you know, I always look at these rankings lists and think, Oh, well, who's the best TCU commitment in the state of Texas. And to me, it came down to Cordell Russell and Cameron cook. And I like Cameron cook so much because he has tremendous footwork. He's an excellent receiver. He's a guy who um, you just can't defend in the box you have to defend him as he'll stretch you out to the flats right he's a guy who can slip out to the slot and do like the slot back thing whenever he needs to um a versatile offensive weapon where i think that he will get a little bit behind us he's not an early enrollee guy you know so he's gonna have to make a quick adjustment in fall camp to be able to make an impact but the talent level is certainly there if you're looking at 2024 backs you know Caden durham's best you know, the best word to describe him speed. Yeah. That dude can fly. As a matter of fact, I watch his tape and I think, is this thing sped up? <laughs> That's how fast he is. Yeah. Greg Powers from uh, Texas uh, football, D Dave Campbell's Texas football joining us right now. Uh, and I'll leave you with this, Greg. We are all fairly Texas centric. We know you are as well. Have you glanced at though, where the Horn Frogs class, you said number two in the state of Texas, where it would stack up nationally? Yeah, I think this is the best TCU class. You know, I started covering uh, recruiting in Texas back in 2007, 2008. Um, the internet era kind of kicked up, you know, around 2002, something like that. I think this is the best TCU class in the internet era, especially considering the transfer portal. But even without that, I still think it's one of the best classes that they've ever signed from top to bottom. And we don't get into the weeds of like, some of these guys that they have on the list, like Benjamin Whitfield and, uh, you know, Naredo, they call him Big Mike Stoker yeah. down at South Oak Cliff. These are offensive tackles that I feel like have a very high potential. They're not graded as high as some of these other guys because they have some work to do once they get to college. And it's hard for some, you know, analysts and stuff like that to see the long term potential. But I think the ceiling is very high. If you walked on to a field and you, and you saw Benjamin Whitfield and you know, big Mike in their pads, they're like the first off the bus type of guys who have a very high potential for development. And I think that they'll be really good. So up and down this list, there isn't any guy that I think is a, a guy that you wouldn't want or you wouldn't take. And I think that that's what separates this class from some of the others. The, the staff at TCU does a tremendous job in the evaluation process and, and they've been doing that. And, and credit to a guy like Jeff Jordan on yes. that staff who is able to work his high school connections, work the people that he knows to find these guys who are not only going to be getting offers from other programs, but can step onto a college campus and get it from a mental perspective. You know, it's not always all about playing football when you're talking about breaking down the college game. 
These guys have to have it and understand what it takes to be successful when they step off the field. That's a big part of it that a lot of fans, you know, don't take into account when they're breaking down some of the skill sets of these top rated recruits. Yeah, very well said, Greg Powers. As always, we appreciate the time and thanks for carving out some for us today. We appreciate the partnership as well. Yeah, no problem, man. I always love to talk about the Frogs and I enjoy the show. Thanks for having me. Well said there, Greg Powers uh, from Dave Campbell's Texas Football. Thanks for hopping on with us today, giving us some time. There goes Greg. All right, uh, the TC women's basketball team is in action tomorrow against Oklahoma State. It's the annual Play for K game for cancer research. It has special meaning this week. We caught up with Reagan Peebling and a couple of her players leading into tomorrow's game. The Play for K this year has a little bit extra meaning. One, um, we just have some players this year that are trying to support and pray over uh, some direct family members that are going through their own cancer battle. Um, you know, Emily Fisher with her dad and Paige Bradley with her sister. So we know that this game is going to um, mean a little something extra special to our team. But the KL Cancer Fund is really designed uh, to provide education, provide research dollars, as well as um, serve the underserved communities for women fighting cancer. My dad has had cancer, colon cancer for many years. Uh, he was diagnosed in 2016 with colon cancer, and it's just been a up and downhill roller coaster. I mean, play for K is very much important to me as it really greatly really affects my family. Yeah, so it's a really good awareness, you know, just having a lot of people know about it. Yeah, it can get really tough sometimes, especially if I know my dad's not feeling well or other stuff's going on at home. It makes it a bit difficult to kind of be on my feet are and not worry about what's going on at home, but this was my dream. My dad always reminds me of that, that this is what I've always wanted, so I just got to take each day as it comes. Their strength during this has been inspirational. Um, we know that the practice, the games, is an opportunity for them to sometimes not have to think about it and worry about it. So we've tried to make sure that that opportunity is there, but also knowing that sometimes that's impossible. And if they've needed a day, if they've needed time, if they've needed someone to talk to, um, that they know that they can access that. They have um, the opportunity to say, today's just not my day, coach. Um, I know that their teammates have been really, really huge for them and supporting them. Um, you know, and I think just uh, our whole team has a prayer circle. Our parents have a prayer circle um, around this team, and they've been included on it every single time. Powerful stuff there from uh, TCU women's basketball. Oklahoma State tomorrow at Showmeyer Arena. Tickets are only a dollar. encourage you to be out there for that one. Of course, the men play on the road. They'll be at Oklahoma State at 1 o'clock tomorrow at Gallagher Iba Arena. That's going to do it for this week's edition of Frogs Today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Greg Powers for stopping by. J.D. Byers, Tony Benford, Amrick Fields, David Bowden. Good gracious. It's a long list this week. Good stuff, all right? We'll be back with you next week. We'll have, of course, State of the Frogs uh, with head coach Jamie Dixon dropping on Tuesday and back with you on Wednesday and Friday of next week with more Frogs Today. Until then, we encourage you to, well, to like, to comment, to share, but most of all, subscribe to frogstoday.com and to our YouTube channel as well. For all of us here at Frogs Today, have yourself a great weekend. See you back here next week. Frogs Today is brought to you by the Flying Tea Club, supporting TCU student-athletes, and by Richard's Rainwater. Say hello to the water of tomorrow. Frogs Today is a production of Roxo Media House. Roxo Media House.